By the way, I mean, like, uh, when the cameras get on, you know, like, play it a bit cool, you know, like, you know, like, a bit nonch, you know what I mean? <laughs> None of that. <laughs> <laughs> going, oh, there, Dad, Doris, there. <laughs> Six million other people going, who's that silly sod? <laughs> Hello, sorry, good evening, good evening, and welcome. Um, after last Saturday's show, featuring the sketch on Stutterers Anonymous, uh, we've had them jamming the switchboard all week. Well, two of them anyway. <laughs> get off the line, you know, write in like all the other weirdos do. We get ever such strange letters on this programme, you know. We've had, we've had one from the Association of Clairvoyants, complaining about a sketch in next week's show. <laughs> We've had, had a letter from the Clairvoyance Association complaining a sketch in next week's show. <laughs> no, I'm right. <laughs> we've, had, we've had quite a few letters from Sun readers as well. Uh, I think they must have got someone to write in for them. <laughs> They keep sending us limericks uh, for some unknown reason. Yeah, I don't know. We've had, we've had half a dozen this week. Uh, here's one. Um, there was a young man called Jasper whose second name I can't remember. <laughs> He's on TV on Saturday night and it finishes somewhere about 12 o'clock. <laughs> and occasionally a bit later. <laughs> The other limits are awful. I don't... <laughs> Pamela Stevenson has written into us. In fact, she sent us four letters, but I don't show you the word. <laughs> what I can show you, what I can show you, is a sensational new pamphlet issued this month by the Department of Health and Social Security. Right? And it's entitled, Was Your Husband Over 65 in 1948? <laughs> trying to work it out, right? <laughs> it's all to do with retirement pensions, and you qualify if, one, your husband was born before the 6th of July, 1883, <laughs> or, second, your husband must have died since the 3rd of July, 1948. So, if, if your grandma hasn't had a stroke yet with the excitement, right, <laughs> get her down to the DHSS first thing Monday morning because, let's face it, they're going to be swamped with the 12 people this applies to. <laughs> so remember, if you were born before the 6th of July, 1883, it's pension time. <laughs> if you were born on the 7th of July, 1883, it's tough tit. <laughs> Uh, the week's news has been dominated by the elections, of course, uh, in Peckham and Northfield. And the big question is, who won? <laughs> well, hang on. In typical party politics gobbledygook, right, they all did. <laughs> Labour say they won because they polled the most votes. <laughs> Some reason. <laughs> <laughs> The Tories are claiming a victory because they didn't expect to win, but nearly did. <laughs> That's a much better conclusion, isn't it? <laughs> However, the SDP are the obvious winners, as they say. If the other two parties hadn't been taking part, they would have walked in. <laughs> you find yourself believing all this nonsense, don't you? Know? And when, when by-elections are held, I love the way they have to cajole all the political heavyweights into backing their respective local candidates. You know, they, they heave them out of London, don't they? Like Cyril Smith and Norman Tebbit and Roy Jenkins, and, and they all suddenly profess an undying love for Northfield and how they were all born there. You know? <laughs> and I'll give everyone a brand new metro if they vote for them. <laughs> well, I've got to do something with them, haven't I? <laughs> And they all scuttle back to London and never set foot in the place again. Still, you've got to vote for somebody, haven't you? I always, I always feel sorry for sun readers when they vote. <laughs> you see, they can't, remain, they can't remain anonymous, can they? I mean, every time they vote, they have to sign the name. <laughs> yeah. 
it's, it's a bit hit and miss who they actually vote for because it depends where the pencil lands on the paper, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Did you, know, did you know anyone can stand for Parliament? Yeah, any, any member of the public, providing they're not insane. <laughs> Just shows the vetting system isn't all it should be, eh? <laughs> it's the same all over the world, though. I mean, well, slight variations, I suppose. In Britain, politicians are very polite, you know. Well, Robin, I, I think Norman might have his facts wrong. In Australia, they're a little less formula. He's a lying bastard! <laughs> Give me five minutes with him and I'll beat the truth out of him! <laughs> the system in Italy is very democratic. There, everybody gets a go at being Prime Minister. <laughs> and of course, with the presence of the Mafia, I mean, there's always a lot of floating voters. <laughs> In El Salvador, they have general elections, and that's who they elect, generally. <laughs> and uh, in America, of course, they have these huge razzmatazz rallies, you know, bands, parties, primaries. The whole thing goes on for two years until they finally elect the president. Then they try and shoot him. <laughs> With all the inherent dangers of, like, you know, ridicule and stuff, have you ever wondered why politicians want to be politicians. I mean, no one's got a good word for them, have they? Well, I have. I mean, Wallies. <laughs> good word, isn't it? It seems to me, the more ridiculous a politician looks and behaves, the more successful they become, you know? I mean, you can't tell me Michael Foote dresses like Wurzel Gummidge by accident. <laughs> right? He's got more publicity out of one duffel coat. <laughs> then there was Harold Wilson. He was, I mean, he had his finger on the button. I mean, he had a pipe, a Gannix Mac, a dog, the wife's diary, Marcia the secretary. He was the first props prime minister. <laughs> and Dennis Seely, he spends hours in the morning, right, like trying to get those two furry caterpillars on his head. <laughs> Before you can become any sort of recognised political leader in this country, you have to pass the audition with Mike Yarwood. Because <laughs> yeah, if he can't take it off, it's a bother, you know, waste of time bothering. <laughs> American politicians, I think, are even better. I mean, they don't bother with all that dressing up business. They just give themselves stupid names, like Zbigniew Brzezinski, <laughs> Kasper Weinberger. <laughs> Spyro Agnew. <laughs> Sounds something like you catch off a toilet seat, innit? <laughs> Mind you, having said that, who could be funnier than ex-president Ford, eh? The man who brought slapstick back into politics. <laughs> I mean, if he entered a room walking on two legs, he got a standing ovation. <laughs> I can walk up right now. <laughs> I'm falling over. <laughs> so, to get to the top in politics, you've got to be eccentric, grossly overweight, get your clothes from Oxfam, have weird, bushy eyebrows, gabble in a strange voice and generally shamble about. Patrick Moore would have been a race in certainty, wouldn't he? Uh, pardon me, madam. May we have a look in that bag, please? What's wrong? Madam, we have reason to believe that certain persons such as yourself, certain shall we say, off-white, <laughs> off-white persons have been attempting to smuggle certain articles into the country. What? Um, you mean drugs? No, madam. More like husbands. Husbands? <laughs> I couldn't get a husband in there. Well, have you got another bag with you? <laughs> I don't understand. Well, madam, as you may know, it is against the law for certain... Dusky. Dusky persons to go flooding the British market with cheap foreign imported husbands. Yes, but I thought the government was going to change all of that. Oh, it is, madam, it is. Well, then. Well, then. Got to get you while we can, haven't we? But I'm not even married. Well, then, madam. I'm afraid you only leave one course of action open to us. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today in the sight of God in this congregation. Uh, 
Uh, well, it's been a, a strange week for news. Mrs. Thatcher went to Berlin yesterday to see the wall. You wouldn't think she was a Pink Floyd fan. <laughs> The civil service are giving people time off to quit smoking, while the secret service are giving them time off for a leak. <laughs> <laughs> and my, my own football team, Birmingham City, have turned... <laughs> a pair of trousers to fit your face. <laughs> turn to the occult, right, to remove the curse on the ground. Seriously. Um, there, they're putting, uh, they're painting the soles of the boots red, they're touching sides of a lucky coin, and they're hanging crucifixes on the floodlights. They were going to put them on the goalposts, but the goalkeeper hates crosses. <laughs> as, uh, as we're a topical show, we couldn't ignore the fact that 501 years ago today, Christopher Columbus was late for his dinner. What time do you call this then? Why, what time is it? You know full well what time it is. Now sit down and eat your dinner. I've been keeping it up for an hour. Probably all dried up by now. I'm not bothered. <laughs> Never mind, you're not bothered. What about your mother? Oh, you can't talk to him. He goes out without his codpiece. He gets, <laughs> he gets his choleric. He gets his choleric and his black bile all mixed up with his yellow bile and his phlegm. But you try telling him. <laughs> he looks at you as if you're daft. Well, it's his attitude, isn't it? It's his attitude to you. It's his attitude to me. <laughs> it's his attitude to everything. Hey, what does he want to do for a living? What's that got to do with it? Sail around the world, don't you? Eh? Sail around the flat world. The world's not flat, actually. Oh, yeah. here we go again. All right, then. <laughs> All right. You go off, then. Do your sailing. You and your mate. That Gordon. Gordon. And when you come, when you come to the end of the world and you plummet into the great blackness and you're lying there at the bottom of the infinite pit... And you're being plagued by a thousand demons of the netherworld. The netherworld. Perhaps then you'll realise the sense of what I'm saying. Dad, I'm not going to plummet anywhere. I'm only going to discover a new continent. A what? A new continent. Discover a new continent? He can't even keep his own bedroom tidy. <laughs> it's all fads with him, that's what it is. Fads. First it was them brocade jackets. Then it was that mandolin he never plays. <laughs> now it's looking for major new land masses. Right. And another thing, Christopher. Have you given a moment's thought as to where you're going to get this boat from to do this sailing in, eh? Because we can't afford it, can we? Not coming so soon after your birthday. <laughs> I'm going to write to John II of Portugal, actually, and ask him to give me one. Mm. Oh, well, that's that sorted out then, isn't it? <laughs> no problem, boat-wise. <laughs> dreamy Dan, isn't he, eh? <laughs> Cloud bloody cuckoo land, that's what it is. Hey, you know what you want to do? You want to be a bit more like your brother, Jack. Jack? Ugh. Jack! Now, you mark my words. Giacomo Columbus. Now, there's a lad that's going to make a name for himself. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll experiment with drugs. Right? Now, I'll, I'll smoke coke. And I'll, I'll sniff marijuana. I'll, I'll even pop glue. Uh, you know something? I, I think it's affecting my brain. <laughs> Good evening. This week, feminism. Presenting the man's point of view, Professor Jacob Ernstein. Hello. And presenting the opposite point of view, the woman's viewpoint, Johnny Caldicott. Hello. <laughs> Has the feminist movement finally achieved equal status for women? Professor? I think so, yes. Johnny? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Yes, well, there we have it. 
Well done, all you women. Oh, hello, Daryl. Yeah, hello, Felicity. Did you have a good weekend? I did. I went to the park. And I went on the swings, and I had a big ice cream. My parents won't let me play in the park. They say parks are a pitifully inadequate concession to the urban proletariat. <laughs> oh. Well, did you do something else nice, then? No. Had to go on one of them CND rallies, didn't I? <laughs> Poor Daryl. Yeah, babies against the bomb. <laughs> Toddlers against Trident. <laughs> Nippers against nukes. It's bloody ridiculous. I must be the only four-year-old in all the world who gets into trouble for jumping into puddles. No, Daryl. All four-year-olds get into trouble for jumping in puddles. Yeah, but not from the special branch. <laughs> they, must, they must have a file on me this thick. So you didn't enjoy the march then? No, but it was worth it to have a go at the fascists. What are fascists? Parents that make you go on bloody stupid marches. <laughs> Mind you, I let them know how I felt about it. What did you do? I made a silent protest. <laughs> how? I wet myself. <laughs> you didn't. I did. Caused a hell of a panic too. Why? Well, it was a very cold day. Everyone thought it was tear gas. <laughs> She strolled in the Savoy, cool and sleek. She goosed the doorman who turned the other cheek. Stevenson, that little Pam, she's the one the critics slam. Her sophisticated wit, they simply could not see. Why do all the papers keep picking on me? The women of the year all think she's quite absurd Just cos all the jokes depend on a four-letter word Stevenson, it is so unfair She'll carry on expelling air And though they all bitch, it's only jealousy Why does everybody keep picking on me? what I've just been doing. That's right. I've been humming a tune. I've been humming it because, well, Dave, Dave the cardboard box, our friend, seems to be a bit late today. It's not like him at all, is it? Mind you, nor is the Channel Tunnel. But then we're not all waiting for the Channel Tunnel. Hey, wait a minute. Maybe Dave's here already. Hey, it's probably one of his practical jokes. So where do you suppose he is? Is he... On the bench? No. Is he up a tree? No. Perhaps he's with a prostitute. <laughs> Doesn't look like it. Wait a minute, there he is in the sandpit, playing. So there you are, Dave. Hey, we've been looking for you everywhere. Oh, uh, excuse me. Oh, you look like someone we know. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> wasn't it? I went up to the wrong box. Oh, well, back to waiting. Mm -hmm. Look, Dave, this is getting ridiculous. You've had your little joke now, but this is actually a professional company, and I think you might try to behave like a professional entertainer. Uh-oh. What's that in the bin over there? Oh, no. Dave's completely smashed. <laughs> I know I told you to act like a professional, Dave, but you didn't have to go the whole hog. Oh, well. See you next week, Dave, in the clinic. Oh, good morning, gringo. Can I help you? Yeah, I've come to get some information about El Salvador. I'm thinking of going there for a holiday. <laughs> you want to go to El Salvador? Yes, well, it seems a nice place, you know, uh, for a family holiday. Are you taking the urine out of my body? <laughs> Sorry if I said something wrong. Uh, no, no, El Salvador is a very beautiful place. Oh, yes, it sounds lovely. I just want to take life easy for a while, you know. Hey, in El Salvador, 
It's easy to take life, eh? <laughs> How about the people? Oh, yes, there are still some people there, yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, are the local people friendly? Oh, si, sí, si, sí, very friendly. Here, have a look. Ah, oh, yes, yes, they're all dancing about in front of the soldiers. Uh, soldiers, very nice. Why are these people lying on the ground? Oh, uh, they're sleeping. <laughs> it's probably siesta, you know. Ah, uh, right. Well, the village was on fire. Uh, was how you say, uh, bonfire night. Oh, bonfire night. See, see, bonfire night. When is that? Well, we have bonfire every day. <laughs> every night. <laughs> really? Gosh, the kids are going to love that. Do you have fireworks as well? You know, rockets. Oh, see, rockets, machine guns, grenades, tanks. Yeah. <laughs> and you burn the guy, Forks? No, we burn communists. <laughs> really? See, so far we burned 26,000 communists. Ah. <laughs> Is that an old tradition in El Salvador? No, it's a new tradition from America. <laughs> Too much fun. Too much fun. Thank you to me. Too much fun. Oh, I'm going to be. Oh, I think I ain't done. I ain't never had too much fun. Well, she was only 17 and she was new to L.A. And I was only willing to show her the way. I'm going down sunset doing fine. I like hers. She like mine. Went to her bar because I wanted some. But you could go to jail for having too much fun. Too much fun. the Hank Wangford Band. <laughs> you have to be a bit careful, don't you? <laughs> you have to be a Radio 1 disc jockey and get that one wrong, you know? Uh, Tuesday, Tuesday, of course, is a very big day for television. Channel 4 is being launched, and it's described as the event of the year. And judging by the repeats, the year is 1963. <laughs> I was... I was Fascinated to see all the programs they're bringing back. You know, the, the Avengers, Upstairs, Downstairs, I Love Lucy. 
I love Lucy. <laughs> Can't we gotta have that woman squawking around the house again? <laughs> Flailing around like a demented windmill. <laughs> she makes Magnus Pice look like a mute tortoise, you know. <laughs> and they're gonna bring they're gonna bring the prisoner back. I thought you'd be excited. <laughs> Oh, what? Eh? Well, I was watching the monitors, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you remember that series with Patrick McGowan? Yeah. Go on, say yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it drove people insane trying to figure it out, you know? I mean, the, the great advantage to Channel 4, of course, is that they can show the episodes of The Prisoner in any old order they want, and it still makes as much sense. <laughs> A bit like Smiley's people. Because <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't as much sex on the television in those days. Well, the sets were too narrow and you'd get falling off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I love that one. <laughs> we'll sack the writer. <coughs> Personally speaking, I, I can't wait to see all the old movies again, uh, especially the science fiction movies, because I'm a, I'm a sci-fi nut, you know. I oh, love them. And uh, science fiction films come in two sorts. There's the high technology ones like Close Encounters, right? Where the ship, ship travels like three billion light years across the cosmos to bring us a Hammond organ. <laughs> Which they can't play. <laughs> of course they don't, they've got no hands, have they? <laughs> Lolly green bits on the end. <laughs> Hello, Earthman. Can you teach Gawalk here to play Coming Round the Mountain? <laughs> I love the names they give these characters as well. Gawalk. <laughs> Zulk. <laughs> Krang. And they, and they walk all around all day and then they, they acknowledge everybody with those ridiculous salutes. You know, Good morning, Captain. Any sign of the aliens? <laughs> well, Commander. Ship passed an hour ago. Power number two, how goes it? No problem, sir. <laughs> Bit like the Freemasons, really, isn't it? <laughs> I'll be writing in there. <laughs> the, other th the other sort of science fiction film is, is The Monster from Outer Space. I think that's my favourite, you know. And this monster, he's travelled millions of miles to come and eat us. And he doesn't even know what we taste like. <laughs> <laughs> and, and while these monsters have the technology to construct molecular transition side-powered spaceships and navigate them through eons of hyperspace, they always end up on Earth plummeting straight into the swamp. <laughs> All that way and they can't find a dry bit. <laughs> So the monster spends the next couple of thousand years wandering around the swamp, you know, squelch, squelch, squelch. And he's thinking, boy, when I get out of this, am I going to give somebody a hard time? <laughs> and he finally gets out, and the first thing he sees is an old couple driving along the road in the battered Model Ford T pickup. And, oh, do, 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 do. <laughs> wonder if we'll come across any monsters from the swamp tonight, Martha. <laughs> oh, here's one. Wonder if he wants a lift. <laughs> glop, glop. They've gone, haven't they? <laughs> it's always two old people in the car. It's never two dozen United supporters in the minute. <laughs> They'd eat him, wouldn't they? <laughs> Another goodie is the mad professor and his humpty back dwarf who live in the big castle, you know. Good evening, sir. <laughs> they press buttons and spikes come up through the floor while the hydraulic ceiling comes down and flattens your head while you're waiting for the knife-edged pendulum. <laughs> what I always wonder is, who installs all that stuff? <laughs> I mean, it certainly wasn't the dwarf. He hasn't got enough mechanical knowledge to stop the front door squeaking. <laughs> I just, I, I just love old movies. <laughs> I, find, I find the trouble with modern films is that, I mean, they spend a fortune trying to create reality. Yet they still ignore those obvious scenes that immediately bring you back to the fact that you're watching a film. Right, for instance, you always get the scene where the detective 
has to find a telephone number in the New York telephone directory. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> it never takes them longer than four seconds. And I mean, if that doesn't arouse feelings of disbelief, wait till they dial the number. <laughs> Hello, Mary. Hello, Frank. <laughs> no telephone system in the world can cope with that sort of speed. Where, where's Mary's phone? Taped to her head. <laughs> Telephone engineer here, ma'am. Where would you like to phone? Oh, just tape it to my head. <laughs> Frank, it's for you. <laughs> Another scene to watch out for is when the police knock on the door. Right? I always measure the time it takes between the knock and the moment when they bash the door down. Right? Dirty Harry has the record. 0.13 of a second. <laughs> bang, 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 bang. There's no one in. Karunk! <laughs> Look, in the, in the time they allow, Sebastian Coe couldn't get out of his eyes. <laughs> Let alone the geezer with eight bullets in his leg. Because <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, Channel 4, Channel 4 is commercial. And, and they're bringing back the old movies, but I wonder if they'll bring back the old commercials as well. Do you, do you remember a few of those? I was just trying to think of them, and uh, things like, uh, You'll wonder where the yellow went when you brush your teeth with Pepsodent. <laughs> we all know where the yellow went on your tongue. <laughs> I wonder where Pepsodent went. <laughs> Probably changed the name and sold it as hair remover. <laughs> do you remember? B. Oh. <laughs> Whisper that to someone ten years ago and they'd go to belt you over the head, wouldn't they? <laughs> Mind you, the whiff would get you first and you'd just like... <laughs> the way to get... The way to get rid of B.O.O. B.O. Was, was to use... <laughs> Was to use that Life Boy carbolic soap. That's what you had to buy. <laughs> I think I'd rather have had BO. <laughs> you sort of end up smelling like a like a school classroom. People kept coming up to you going, hey. <laughs> did you used to have BO? <laughs> <coughs> However, we've actually stolen a march on Channel 4. If you're a B-movie fan, I've got a, a special treat for you now. Two friends of mine, this is genuine, two friends of mine, Robbie Coltrane and Chris Ryan, along with Kay Stonham from the cast here, have made their very own special B-movie trailer. I thought you might like to see it. Here it is, The Hands of Dr. Madness. Scarier than the terror of the cat people. More terrifying than the return of the monster. <laughs> At last it can be shown, the hands of Dr. Madness. Dr. Madness. Horror to make your heart stop. Fear to chill your bones. Terror to make you fool yourself. Dr. Madness, starring Robert Coltrane as Dr. Madness. Hi. Co-starring Christopher Ryan as the brilliant concert pianist, more handsome than Clark Gable, tougher than Humphrey Bogart, even shorter than Alan Ladd. <laughs> as the girl who gets no lines and screams a lot. <laughs> it started with the couple who had everything. <laughs> he, the brilliant concert pianist. She, his loving wife. 
until that fateful night. medical profession for his weird experiments, transplanting the vocal cords of Frank Sinatra and Andy Williams into the bodies of gorillas. Making near-perfect clones of Marlon Brando. Aye, aye. I could have taken Thompson. Wilson. Awesome. Apart that night. So what happens? He gets a title shot outdoors in the ballpark. And what do I get? A one-way ticket to Bourneville. A Lucaville. Mr. Orlick, I can help you. Here's what I propose. Near here is the grave of the famous Russian penis, Tchaikovsky. We'll dig him up. We'll bring him back to life. We'll chop off his hands. We'll bury him again. And we'll graft his hands onto you. That's incredible. And they said Einstein was mad. No, they didn't. Well, he would have if he thought up this crap. <laughs> Like your new hands, Mr. Orlick? <laughs> wonderful, Doctor. Absolutely wonderful. I... I... <laughs> What's happening? Doctor, the hands. They seem to have a life of their own. Doctor, Doctor, what's happening to me? I, I guess I should have told you, Orlick. Tchaikovsky wasn't exactly a ladies' man. I can't control the heat. It seems as though they want me to... The hands of Dr. Madness coming to this theater soon with Laurel and Hardy as themselves. Appearing in London this week is one of the great stars of the American musical theater. So, direct from Broadway, will you please welcome Miss Pearl Jones. Thank you, Jasper. Uh... Hello, everybody. It's so great to be here. You know, I just love England. It uh, reminds me of my backyard. <laughs> now, uh, we Americans, <laughs> and uh, you British, well, we haven't been getting along too well lately, and I'd just like to do my bit to bring us a little closer together with a little song. It was specially written for me by a good buddy from the Hollywood days, Mr. Ronald Reagan. <laughs> You gotta quit knocking Uncle Sam Cause Ron is trying to do all he can But he ain't having much success If he fails, I guess The Democrats will flush him down the pan We heard you were trading with the commies That's a pretty shitty thing to do Just because we're selling grain to the old Ukraine That ain't no call to sell the pipeline to He doesn't want to buy your British steel He says, if you carry on like this I'll take away your missile And squeeze your pips Until you squeal You gotta quit knocking Uncle Sam He's got you out of many a jam You gotta quit knocking it You gotta put a sock in it Why don't you quit 
For some time now, Henshaw, we've been aware that Soviet agents have been infiltrating this department. Yes, sir. We believe that in modern espionage, we have to develop a more sophisticated screening technique. Just asking a chappy whether he's really working for the Soviets isn't good enough. <laughs> but we have been using that technique since the Second World War, sir. Yes, but we've heard from a very reliable source that the Soviets have found a way around it. Sir? <laughs> it's a technique that our cipher boys are calling telling lies. <laughs> I'm not quite sure I'm familiar with that technique, sir. Well, basically, it seems, you tell a chap something that isn't true. Mm -hmm. you know, to uh, mislead him. Mm -hmm. Or cover up something. Mm -hmm. Still not quite with you, sir. <laughs> Let me give you an example. Right, sir. There's a fish in your ear. No, it's insane. No, I, I think you're mistaken, that's... That's brilliant. <laughs> How long have the Soviets been using this technique? We're not sure, Henshaw. It could be years. Well, all congratulations to our chaps at Cypher for cracking it, eh? Mm -hmm. This could totally revolutionise the whole service, sir. What's it called again, sir? Telling lies. Oh, by the way, I put cyanide in your coffee. <laughs> You've done what? Just trying out the new line technique, sir. <laughs> Good. God, that's brilliant. <laughs> I was totally taken in. <laughs> well, you seem to have grasped it very quickly, Henshaw. You better go back and teach it to the rest of your department. Right, sir. Henshaw! Oh, sorry, sir. I thought you were telling lies, sir. Sorry. <laughs> well, I'd better be going. Tell you the truth, I have got rather a lot of work on my desk, sir. Off you go, then, Henshaw. Did you believe that, sir? <laughs> I haven't got any work on my desk, sir. I was lying, sir. Don't push things too far, Henshaw. Pardon? Didn't quite catch that, sir. I said... Yes, I know, sir. Don't I... push... I heard you really, sir. Sorry, I couldn't resist it. Oh. <laughs> All this lying, sir, I mean, it's getting completely out of hand. It's making my head dizzy. Is it? No, sir. <laughs> Look, Henshaw. <laughs> Can you stop lying now? It's getting on my nerves. Uh, um, uh, sorry, sir. No. I was lying then. <laughs> nice one, sir. No. Nice one. Well, I'll be going. No, really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Henshaw. Yes, sir? You're not working for the Soviets, are you? No, sir. That's all right, then. <laughs> Catherine will be down in a minute. Going to the pictures tonight, are you? Thank you, need Dibley. Bob Sirusa will both. Oh, yeah. Very nice. Well, she'll be down in a minute, I should think. You little fang kang. Oi, oi, booby, rastas. <whistles> Younger kang. Ronzi! <laughs> Ronzi, easy dip dop. Hey! <laughs> Cruzo, blap, blap, fringle, bop, bop. Karatsa, tish. <laughs> Oinkle, zing, zoink. Tittlebug. <laughs> I just don't understand the kids of today. <laughs> In a week in which the Siberian pipeline deal ran into further trouble, the New York Stock Exchange fell a record number of points, the unemployment figures were down on the previous record. What was your opinion? No ET, no comment. <laughs> Good evening. This week we're discussing the world shortage of swivel chairs. Sitting on my lap, is Steve Frost, <laughs> and sitting on his lap is Mark Arden. <laughs> Next week, we'll be discussing the meanness of the BBC in providing gin for presenters. Ginormous fun here. <laughs> right, panel, let's have a look at our next saucy sentence. The bridegroom came out of the bathroom, took down his trousers to reveal his long pink blank. <laughs> well, that's a tricky one, eh? I wonder what it could be. There's always a clue in the sentence, of course. Could it be his long pink pajamas? 
How about a long pink double decker? <laughs> well, I think our uh, panel is about ready now, is that correct? So let's with our, see what our contestant, Debbie Bishop, makes of this. Hello, Debbie. The bridegroom came out of the bathroom, took down his trousers to reveal his long pink. Well, I think it's probably wrong, but uh, penis. <laughs> I think that has quite a reasonable chance. <laughs> what have you got? Hey, ha! Number one. Number two. How again? <laughs> number three is dead. <laughs> oh, three up, three to go. What have you got? <laughs> Penis! <laughs> hey, what's the wacky one got? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Can we accept that? <laughs> Well, I couldn't spell that, but I've got a picture of one. 